One of the most dramatic developments in labor force participation over the last half century has been the sharp influx of women into the workforce. In fact, that participation has roughly doubled since 1950, from 34 percent to about 60 percent today. At the same time, labor force participation by older men has fallen sharply, particularly for men over 65. A change probably due in large part to changes in programs such as Medicare and Social Security, which offer far more generous health and retirement benefits. Regarding hours worked, the typical American works between 35 and 40 hours a week. Nonetheless, many workers work as much as 50 to 60 hours a week at the same or a second job. And in fact, there are a variety of incentives, such as overtime pay, that can greatly affect hours worked. In this regard, one of the most interesting analytical concepts in labor market economics has to do with something called the backward bending curve. The idea here is that the higher the wage, the more people will be willing to work, but only to a point. And after that point, people will actually work less. Can you think of an intuitive reason why this might be so? The reason is that at higher wages, workers can afford more leisure, even though each extra hour of leisure costs more in wages foregone. To see this, put yourself in the shoes of a worker who is offered higher hourly rates and the freedom to choose the number of hours worked. On the one hand, there is a substitution effect. The more you work, the more you will earn, so each hour of leisure becomes more expensive to you as the wage rate rises. Your incentive, then, is to substitute work for leisure. On the other hand, there is an income effect. The higher the wage, the higher your income, so you will be able to take that extra week of vacation to ski in Colorado or sun yourself in Miami. So at what point in this graph do you think the income effect dominates? That's right, from point C upward, the income effect outweighs the substitution effect, and the amount of labor supply declines as wage rates climb higher. A final important determinant of labor supply is immigration. In recent years, this has become a potent political issue for many reasons, not perhaps the least of which is that as immigration increases, everything else being equal, wages tend to decline. Here's one particular way this has happened. Since 1970, the percentage of the foreign-born United States population has more than doubled, from only 5% to well over 10%. More importantly, the characteristics of the immigrants have changed. During the 1950s, Europe and Canada were the major sources of primarily high-skilled workers. However, beginning in the 1980s, the biggest groups of now primarily less skilled and less educated immigrants have come from places like Mexico, the Philippines, and Vietnam, as well as from Central American and Caribbean countries like Nicaragua and Jamaica. The result has been a significant increase in the supply of low-skilled workers and a sharp decline in the wages of less educated groups relative to the college educated, just as our theory would predict.